That's great. Thanks again. Um, we already discussed some of these topics during the, the lab session, but I'll expand on a couple of the other uh, insights here in terms of risk factors and strategies for managing this intraoperatively. So in terms of how patients may present if there's ongoing um, intracranial hypotension, either from an incidental durotomy, like what may happen in the operating room, or other reasons why a patient may have intracranial hypotension from siphoning of CSF spontaneously. Um, it all stems back to the fact that there's a certain amount of fluid that surrounds our um, intracranial compartments uh, that helps provide a cushioning. And when there is a loss of CSF through a durotomy or some form of a trauma resulting in a skull base uh, dehiscence or fracture, um, there is a, a leak of CSF um, that can result in, these, uh, in this constellation of symptoms of postural headaches, uh, posterior neck discomfort, tinnitus, cognitive fog, dizziness, muffled hearing. And of course, if a patient is recently post-op, we would be um, noticing that as soon as they went to get up, either on post-op day one or two, they would have these postural headaches that resolve uh, when they lay flat. Or we may even see leaking of uh, fluid through the incision. Um, but if this is not an incidental durotomy situation, the differential diagnosis of a patient who presents with these symptoms does still remain broad and needs to be worked up for that differential before settling on a diagnosis of intracranial hypotension. Um, so really, how do we sort this out? And I discussed some of this uh, in my earlier STED talk um, a couple months ago. Uh, but you know, if there's a spontaneous intracranial hypotension where a patient is presenting with these symptoms without having had spine surgery, um, the, the workup for this patient really starts with some form of spinal imaging, usually an MRI. Uh, if the MRI reveals the presence of one of these um, epidural collections or a spon uh, spinal longitudinal epidural collection, an SLEC, uh, it leads towards a myelogram where there's a suspicion for a leak of fluid through either a ventral disc osteophyte complex, as shown in the left, which is a type 1 CSF leak, or a tear in the axilla of the nerve root as it exits um, through the foramen. Usually these are associated with some form of a perineural cyst or a meningeal diverticula that's torn. Uh, and these would be um, identified on a myelogram, as you can see on the digital subtraction images to the right. Um, in the case of a type 2 um, leak, uh, one could consider a blood patch. A source of um, intracranial hypotension leading to headaches that's become more recently appreciated is the presence of a CSF venous fistula. Uh, at first, when I heard about these, I didn't quite believe them, but, but they do indeed exist, and they can be seen on myelograms. And intraoperatively, we can appreciate this phenomenon, which is that there is some abnormal connection between uh, a draining vein. Usually, these have like a pretty dense venous plexus in the epidural space, and they're connected uh, oftentimes to some form of a dilated meningeal diverticula. Uh, it's just a perfect collision between the two elements that results in this abnormal connection between the CSF space and the venous system. Uh, as you can see on this uh, myelogram image, I'm not sure if my mouse is. Can you see my mouse as a pointer? Yeah, okay. You can see an abnormal extravasation of contrast into the venous system. Uh, in these cases, the treatment is either an endovascular approach, which uh, at our hospital, at least we don't have that capability, but it has been reported, versus a surgical clipping of the uh, neuro, uh, neural element as long as it's in the thoracic spine that obliterates that abnormal connection and egress of CSF. Okay, so in terms of uh, incidental durotomy uh, overview, uh, there are certain risk factors that, uh, this is where I want to spend most of this talk, is uh, really discussing this time um, on this talk is uh, really uh, the rate of incidental durotomies uh, intraoperatively, what are the risk factors and how to manage those. And so the risk factors um, are advanced age, revision surgeries, higher BMI, and high risk zones, uh, anatomic zones, uh, either along the caudal margin of the cranial lamina uh, at a herniated disc level or the medial aspect of a facet joint. In terms of what I uh, quote to patients as a risk factor for an incidental durotomy can approach upwards of 20%. Um, in our hands, it's somewhere around 2 to 3%, which is on the lower end of what's been reported in the literature, but let's approximate that as a 
um, a 10% risk of an incidental neuronomy, especially in these higher risk categories. Uh, and the risk of needing a reoperation for a persistent leak uh, is about 10%. So um, the overall risk for having to take a patient back uh, to the operating room is around 1% um, from the index lumbar surgery. The strategies uh, for managing an incidental durotomy or a persistent leak are either re-exploration, subarachnoid drains, paraspinous muscle flaps, and CSF diversion, all of which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the reason to take these seriously is that when patients present with intracranial hypotension, uh, they can end up having um, these posterior fossa hemorrhages, uh, amongst other things like subdural hematomas, um, all from the negative pressure in the intracranial space. So uh, these do need to be taken seriously. Uh, the risk factors for incidental durotomies. Um, last time when I uh, gave that STED talk, there were some very interesting questions and presentations that had come up, and I wanted to explore some of those uh, in greater detail. So, you know, there's this interesting phenomenon between low bone density and the rate of incidental durotomies. And so, when um, some studies have looked at the correlation between Hounsfeld units and the risk of a durotomy, and so um, what they found is that with osteoporotic or osteopenic bone, there can be a higher rate of incidental durotomies. And the biology behind that is that there may be some kind of maintenance pathway between uh, the dura that provides uh, certain um, uh, factors that help with osteoblastic differentiation through BMP, uh, BMP2 signaling cascades. And so it can go both ways that uh, the bone is important for maintenance of dura and, and vice versa. And so patients with uh, poor bone density or low bone density may be at a higher risk for uh, durotomies. Collagen vascular disorders, this has been reported as well as a patient population where there may be an increased risk of spontaneous CSF leaks. Um, there's, uh, this isn't all that widespread in terms of uh, widely reported in terms of the incidence of this, but there is, has been a link. Uh, and it's thought to be related to an abnormality of fibrillin-containing microfibrils, which lead to a disruption of the overall extracellular matrix of the dura that leads to a dural weakness that can lead to spontaneous tears, uh, leading to CSF leaks like the type 2 CSF leaks that we've seen. Um, from an anatomic standpoint, uh, there is uh, a series of anatomic considerations that are actually really important when we're doing lumbar decompressions. Uh, this uh, study right here described a ligament um, that attaches somewhere between the midline uh, dorsal aspect of the, of the dura towards the caudal margin and the ligamentum flavum. Um, and because of its importance in terms of um, being avulsed and resulting in durotomies, the authors had called this ligament ATA, and uh, it took me a while to find exactly what ATA stood for. Um, and they do describe it in their paper as uh, attention to the terminal attachment, meaning that if you don't pay attention to it, uh, you have a high risk of uh, having a durotomy during your lumbar decompressions. Uh, and so you can see the, the nerve hook here is pulling up on that uh, terminal attachment of the ligament deflavum as it goes to the dura. So usually in the operating room, I'll, I'll search for that uh, with a Woodson or a dental instrument and uh, cut it sharply with uh, medicine bomb scissors or micro scissors before, um, before inadvertently avulsing it with a kerosene instrument. Also beware of pathologies with dural attachments. Uh, these can change the mood of the day pretty quickly. Uh, there are reports of, um, these are rare but can happen, is uh, dural calcifications. Um, and in uh, decompressing the neural elements, uh, the dura can actually come with the with the pathology, so uh, knowing that certain pathologies like this exist are important, not only in terms of guiding your operative approach, but also the plan for reconstruction techniques and whether you'll need some kind of dural graft, as we saw uh, in the lab today. Uh, ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, what can appear as a benign uh, disc herniation resulting in myelopathy on an MRI can be further assessed uh, on CT scan, and you'll see that actually what looked like a disc herniation or calcified disc herniation is actually OPLL. And then calcified thoracic disc can also, uh, are often uh, densely adherent to the dura as well. And so all of this is important for making sure that uh, you're prepared when you get to the operating room uh, to um, repair uh, a dural tear. So what are the strategies for managing these incidental durotomies? And 
this outline here really is uh, the uh, basic tenets of managing uh, these incidental durotomies. Uh, you need some kind of suture. Um, I, I train primarily uh, closing these with 4 neurons, but I tend to now use uh, 5 or 6 prolines with a BV1 needle. So I would just uh, urge trainees to also pay attention to what kind of needles are available. Um, you can have a very small suture caliber, but if you're being given one of these larger needles, it's going to make closing the dura very challenging. So um, what I tend to use for the closure of these uh, durotomies is one of those smaller needles, like the BV1 that you see in the top. The pattern really varies on the, the uh, dimensions and the geometry of the, the durotomy, uh, but it can be running, it can be a figure of eight, it can be a horizontal mattress suture, and I'll show an example of that in, uh, in the next slide. Uh, and then I like to buttress uh, defects with either fat or muscle. I tend to use more fat than muscle. Uh, and then the closure of the defect uh, with various grafts, as we saw in the lab, we used uh, bovine pericardium, there's alloderm uh, and other types of allografts. Uh, and also there's autologous uh, fascial grafts that can be obtained from uh, the thoracolumbar fascia. Um, and then we check the quality of the repair with Valsalva. I uh, need to make sure that the thecal sac is enough turgor to provide uh, sensitive evaluation. So if you ask for a Valsalva and there's really no turgor in the CSF space, that's not going to be a very sensitive nor specific uh, readout in terms of whether we have a good repair. And then continue to monitor it through the phase three or the release phase of the Valsalva to make sure that when the venous return increases that you're not uh, missing uh, the possibility of an ongoing CSF leak. This is just an example of a bigger a uh, fascial graft that we use to close um, an intended big dural opening for the resection of an intramedullary tumor. So sometimes we have, um, uh, this is uh, not an incidental durotomy, this was an, uh, very much an intended durotomy to fix a ventral CSF leak. Uh, this was a type 1 CSF leak in the thoracic spinal cord. So just to orient, this is the, the spinal cord running here uh, with a blue proline suture that's uh, being, that was put through the dentate ligament, which was then sectioned, and then that allowed for rotation of the spinal cord. You can see the ventral osteophyte uh, was uh, dissected away uh, from the, the dural breach. And then in order to close it, this, is, this really just highlights that, you know, in order to close these types of defects, even if it's in the lateral recess or if it's in the midline, really have to make sure that you have a safe working corridor to make sure you can visualize the dural tear, uh, the margins of the dura, so that you can throw these sutures in a way that uh, you're safe and you're effective. And so in this case, we've drilled away enough of the posterolateral elements that we can safely throw those sutures. And so we close the dorsal opening with a four neural on stitch, surgery cell, and then we'll talk about this last step, which is the tissue fibrin glue. And so what is the role of fibrin glue? actually have tended to not use fibrin glue more recently. Um, it's a purified uh, human fibrinogen and thrombin. It was uh, approved in 1998 uh, for cardiothoracic procedures as well as intra-abdominal procedures. Uh, and it's used, uh, and then it became, it, it's, it was, um, surgeons started to use it for cranial neurosurgical procedures to reduce the risk of CSF leaks. <clears throat> but what are the downsides? There's a cost. Um, there's a possibility that it may interfere with uh, actual fibroblast migration and, uh, and uh, definitive uh, closure of the dural uh, breach. There's a prep time of three to five minutes. Uh, there's also a possibility that it may interfere with arthrodesis as well, to which extent I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, and the question is, does it help? And so in the study of uh, 4,800 patients, a little over 4,800 patients, uh, there was a risk of uh, incidental durotomy of about 10%. And when these authors looked at whether there was an impact of fibrin glue on having to take a patient back uh, for a persistent leak, uh, it turned out that there really was no significant difference between whether fibrin glue was used or not. And so there's really no data to say that fibrin glue really makes a big difference in, um, uh, in actually achieving a, a good closure. Subfascial drains, um, very uh, similar to what we were talking about earlier in terms of MIS approaches and why MIS approaches may not have a 
uh, may have a lower risk of having a persistent leak uh, is because there's just so much more tissue that can contain the pseudomeningocele that it allows the durotomy to close itself. And so subfascial drains by similar method allow for uh, draining out the CSF um, through layers and layers and layers of tissue that allows CSF to find, um, uh, really have a very difficult time creating some kind of uh, transcutaneous fistula. And so with the use of these subfascial drains, there's a reported lower risk of uh, reoperation and a similar length of stay. So having these drains doesn't increase the length of stay. And in fact, there's a relative risk reduction of uh, in 30 and 90 day um, readmissions as seen in this one study. <clears throat> And then early versus delayed mobilization after primary repair. Uh, this just came out last year. Uh, this was a study of 361 patients, uh, 254 who were uh, in the early mobilization group versus 107 in the delayed mobilization group. And what was defined as early versus late was 24 hours. So it's, even the early group is not necessarily uh, tremendously early. Uh, what uh, the authors found here uh, is that the early group had a lower rate of wound-related complications and also had a lower, shorter length of stay. Uh, paraspinous muscle flaps for uh, persistent CSF leaks. And so here's an example of a pseudomeningocele uh, that has formed in a delayed fashion, resulting in expansion of the paraspinous muscles. Uh, and so what these authors have proposed is having a Z-plasty technique to overlay the, the muscles, advance the muscles, uh, the paraspinous muscle flaps, and close them uh, in a, in a Z-plasty form. And uh, there was a, a full resolution of the pseudomeningocele in all of those 10 patients. And then the last is uh, subarachnoid drainage versus oversewing. Uh, so um, in this study, the oversew technique is what you see here. Um, this is much more rigorous than what happens when we tend to oversew. Uh, which is usually just a figure of eight suture, but here the authors actually did a pretty rigorous uh, vertical mattress suture um, versus a subarachnoid drainage. Um, and what they found is that there was, uh, and again, their output was really, their outcome was more qualitative than quantitative, uh, but they found that with subarachnoid drainage as opposed to oversewing, there was a more excellent um, uh, outcome in terms of really being able to uh, manage the persistent CSF leak. So this would say that if there is an ongoing CSF leak, you could consider oversewing, uh, but that may just be putting our head in the sand and rather you may need some form of diversion in the form of a subarachnoid drainage, which is a lumbar drain. Um, and actually just to put some numbers behind the lumbar drainage, the, the rate of drainage for uh, the placement of, with the placement of a lumbar drain is around 10 cc's per hour to get an adequate diversion of CSF. So the take home points, intracranial hypotension can occur spontaneously. It doesn't just have to be what happens in the operating room. Uh, risk factors for intraoperative incidental durotomy are primarily related to anatomy and pathology, uh, but there may be some other contribution of bone density or collagen vascular disorders. Uh, intraoperative management of durotomy is directed towards achieving a good primary repair. And then early mobilization should be considered following an incidental durotomy with adequate, uh, when you have adequate intraoperative closure. All right. Thank you. That's so helpful and it's clarity and so overlooked and appreciate all the thoughts that you put into this. So again, one more time, if you have a patient where you can't get a good dural closure um, and you're just not sure, should we keep those patients at bed rest for 48 hours to 72 hours? Yeah, that's, that's fair. And so I, I think that is one very legitimate way of trying to get a good, um, some, somewhat of a definitive closure, um, especially in cases where a patient has been previously radiated. Uh, we've done some form of um, like a, you know, some form of large intradural tumor resection with like schwannomas that have been previously operated on or um, if there's you know, some other big oncologic procedure where a patient has been on chemo, et cetera, and there's high risk for not being able to go back in and have a definitive closure. In those cases, especially, a very important strategy is prolonged bed rest. Yeah, so that's still something that I don't um, fully understand because, again, at the same time, when we move patients in bed, they have very high 
Valsalva maneuvers, and we actually measured that in orthopedics for other factors, and that was always just one of those things that's still not fully resolved for me. It makes sense, but it also doesn't make sense. So, and do anticoagulants patients if you have them down a bed rest? Yeah. So full yeah. anticoagulation. Yeah, that's right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Feelings, you're live.